<clears throat> the first uh, video I did for this channel was a review of um, Wrecked Planet. And I wanted to come back to that today because I've had the opportunity since doing that video to read everything associated with the story thus far. Um, I've got the Deleted Scenes book. I've got Heartsick Horror. <clears throat> I just uh, this week got um, Salamandroid Death Sting. Um, so yesterday, as a birthday present for myself, I uh, reread everything of the the new era, starting with Blood Honey, going to Wreck Planet, Heart Sick Horror, the deleted scenes, and then um, ending with Death Sting. And I wanted to do it all in one fell swoop so that I had the experience of doing it like a movie. Doing it all in one sitting rather than piecemeal. And I had some new thoughts and some crystallization of old thoughts that uh, distilled into something different or more enhanced that I wanted to share today in this video, as well as some um, ancillary thoughts about not just what Cyberfrog is, but what Cyberfrog is. Um, so to introduce this, I should, and I can preemptively hear the groans and see the eyes roll, but I should talk about, because I'm going to be comparing uh, or drawing some comparisons in the first part of this video, the Ethan Van Skyver experience from 2016 to date with Finnegan's Wake. As anyone who's uh, known me for any short period of time over the last three years knows, I compare everything sooner or later to Finnegan's Wake, but I think it's very germane in this instance. Finnegan's Wake is an old Irish pub song about a bricklayer named Tim Finnegan who enjoys a drop of the crather every morn. He, he enjoys having a, an eye-opener, a, a pick-me-up, a wake-me-up before going to work. And one morning he has uh, a drop too much and it makes his head feel heavy as he's climbing the ladder. And he falls from the ladder and he breaks his skull and he's dead. And so his friends carry him home to have a wake in the pub. And unsurprisingly for an Irish wake in a pub, pretty soon a, uh, a brawl breaks out because uh, Finnegan's got at least two or three girlfriends among the crowd who are all sort of insisting that they be given the, uh, the honor of prime mourner. And they all get into a fight, which gets all the women in the pub fighting, which gets all the men in the pub fighting, and pretty soon the war breaks out. It's woman to woman and man to man. And in the battle, one mourner throws a bottle of whiskey at another mourner, and it misses crashes into the wall, shatters, and the liquor scatters over Tim's corpse. And then Tim revives. See how he rises. Finnegan rising in the bed. 
saying, whirl your whiskey around like blazes, thunder and Jesus, did you think I'm dead? It's a fun song, um, but James Joyce saw in it an allegory for the fall and redemption of mankind. Part of that comes from the symbolism of the whiskey. Of course, whiskey comes from the Irish term whiskey bay, which comes from the Celtic term usquebaugh, which means water of life. So it's the water of life that revives Finnegan. So Joyce went and wrote, I'll call it a novel, but to call it a novel is, is too short-sighted because it's, it's, it's more than a novel, it's all novels, called Finnegan's Wake, which um, attempts to capture the entirety of human existence between its pages. And in so doing, Joyce was constrained to melt the English down I'm sorry, melt the English language down to molten lava and then recast it in a form that he liked. So he, he essentially reinvents the English language to tell this story. Now, why I've always likened this story to Ethan Van Skyver is that this is an allegory that perfectly captures what happened to him in the wake of the election of Donald Trump to the presidency. Ethan was off to work one day. He had a celebration before working in the form of, uh, in, rather than having a drop of the crather in the morn, he celebrated with a tweet of him holding a, or wearing a MAGA hat. And as a result, that led to his fall from the ladder. Did he fall? Was he pushed? I think... Uh, it's more accurate to say that someone was on the roof, like in a Three Stooges movie, uh, pushing the top of the ladder away to make him fall as a result of his celebration. But from the ladder he went. And he crashed to the concrete below, ending his relationship with DC Comics. And I won't call them his friends who assembled at the wake, but his former co-workers carried him home, his corpse, to wake. And they wrapped him up in a nice clean sheet and laid him out upon the bed with a barrel of porter at his feet and a bucket of whiskey at his head. And they celebrated and you can you can see the tweets from that time how they celebrated but a funny thing happened in that they pushed him from the ladder and they held his wake but he didn't die and the whiskey scattered over poor old Ethan and he sits up in bed and says, Thunder in Jesus, do you think I'm dead? And with that, Ethan rose from the bed and launched Cyberfrog. And I thought about that a lot this summer. This summer, I um, set myself a project where I decided to hit eBay. And hit Amazon and see if I couldn't track down the individual issues, the um, the individual Cyberfrog 
from the or, uh, from the nineties. So I got the two Hall of Heroes issues. Hall of Issues, issue zero. The four Harris issues. Reservoir Frog. Cyber Frog issue zero. The origin revealed. The two issues of the commemorative edition, which were essentially reprints of the Harris issues. I'm sorry, the Hall of Heroes issues. Amphibionics 1 and 2. And a fair amount, although not an exhaustive amount, of the um, variant covers. And these came in one at a time uh, over the course of this summer. And so I noticed in their coming in something that, I, that had escaped me when I initially read them in the warts and all reprint volume. The first thing that stands out, obviously, is the first Hall of Heroes cover and how Ethan redid it for Unforgettable Tales number one. And he did the same thing with Unforgettable Tales number two, which is a redoing of Hall of Heroes number two. Unforgettable Tales number three is um, a redoing of a cover that my understanding is was never published, but uh, was recovered when uh, Ethan got in contact with Trent Canuga. And then of course, Unforgettable Tales number four is there were two versions that came out, each of which is a redoing of the two variant cover, the two original variant covers of Cyber Frog versus Creed. And then we get to the Harris books and the first cover of the Harris book uh, blech, of the Harris books um, shows up on the shoulder blade, the right shoulder blade of Heather Swain as a tattoo in Blood Honey, and in a way that didn't even occur to me when I was reading Rewards and All, it struck me that what we're seeing here is a relaunch, a redo, a reboot, a rebirth. Not just of Cyberfrog, but of the beginning of Ethan's career he had Jay Lee do a variant cover during the Harris run so he had Jay Lee do a cover for Blood Honey and a cover for the Ash Can he I think we can all say uh, it would be Unlikely that he would get Eric Larson to come back and do his Reservoir Frog cover. So Ethan redid it himself 
four warts and all. In the halcyon days of the 90s, the Three Musketeers at Harris were Ethan, Trent Canuga, and Matt Martin. So Matt and Trent both came back to do books for all caps. This is a rebirth. This is a man starting his life over, starting his career over, starting his vision over in every way imaginable after rising from the bed. And it kind of fits that one of the last, uh, not the last, but one of the last things that Ethan did when he was at DC was DC Rebirth. So as my old English professor used to say, the syllabus hangs together. Sooner or later, it all fits. Or, as Tuttle would say, coincidence is the language of the universe. Coincidence is the universe speaking directly to us, saying, pay attention, this is significant. I always um, find it interesting in comic book art when I won't call it coincidence but certain images replay themselves because it highlights that image's significance um, an example would be um, the, the original cover of uh, Swamp Thing uh, the first appearance I can't remember which it was one of DC's gothic Anthology titles, House of uh, Secrets or something. Uh, I think Tales of the Unexpected. I don't remember which. But um, it's it's um, Alex Olsen's wife doing her hair for the evening before going to bed, looking in the vanity mirror, and there's this hulking thing coming through her window. In the, the original tale, Swamp Thing was Alex Olson, not Alex Holland. And then we see, I think it was Steve Bissett returns to that image um, in the uh, in Alan Moore's saga of the Swamp Thing run. Now it's Abby uh, Arcane at the vanity, looking over her shoulder and seeing Swamp Thing come in. And then uh, years later, during the Grant Morris and Mark Millar. Miller, Millar, Ron, um, they, they come back to that image. And there's a similar image in the Cyberfrog mythos of Heather walking through the cemetery and Ben Riley is presenting himself as a menacing figure behind her. Um, that image appears in the Hall of Heroes run. It appears in the Harris run, and then it appears again in Blood Honey. And there are no accidents. This is an image that we're supposed to pay attention to because it is significant. I leave it to the listener, to the viewer, to the reader. To determine what its significance is, but Heather walking through the cemetery with Ben Riley behind her is significant. Which brings me to the new era. And having read the book. 
in its entirety now. If it were a trade paperback, I've now read the entire trade. Um, the symbolism that I um, alluded to in my first video was crystal clear to me last night. And I also noticed some things that I hadn't noticed before. So I want to preface this by saying this is my interpretation of what Blood Honey and Wreck Planet mean. My interpretation of the underlying allegory. I'm going to tell you what I see, and I'm also going to tell you how I saw it. Because how I saw it was a lot like how I taught myself how to read Interlac when I was a Legion of Superheroes fan. I, uh... You would get these things in Interlac, and I would look at them, and suddenly it became obvious that this has got to be an E. Okay, so you, you know this is an E, and there are a couple groupings of three letters ending in E, I'm going to guess that those words are the, which makes, now that I know this is an E, I can guess this is a T and this is an H. And from that, I would sooner or later decipher the whole, the whole cryptogram. That's how I discovered my view, or that's how I crystallized my view of the allegory of Cyberfrog. And where it happened to me, I had read it a couple times, and it was uh, one night I couldn't sleep. I woke up early, or I got out of bed early, maybe 4 o'clock, and decided to do Cyberfrog again. And the E in this equation was... Um, as I said in my last video, Cyberfrog coming out of the Schuylkill and seeing the utter waste that is Philadelphia. And I knew, like, like when a magic eye parts and you see the sailboat, I knew what I was looking at because it wasn't just the destruction. Philadelphia hadn't just been destroyed. It had been changed and transformed into something else, something hideous. Something that would something that the Vispas made and built that would only appeal to Vispas. And I knew that what I was looking at was the destruction and the remaking not of a city, but of an industry. The Vispas had destroyed something other people built and other people enjoyed and other people loved and they'd recreated it into something only they could make use of. And I realized in that moment that our world, not just Philadelphia, but our world was the comic book industry. And the Vispas were the SJWs who had destroyed it and remade it into something ghastly and without appeal to anyone. And then, working from there, if the the muted and destroyed Earth, the wrecked planet, is the comic book industry. And the Vispas are the SJWs. And I, 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 I'm going to stop on this point for a minute because it took me forever to work the word Vispus. 
I like I, I, I just had the uh, the clouds part and the the beam of sunlight, the human sunbeam, come down on me within the last two weeks on the word vispa. So I'm going out of chronological order of my sleuthing and my deduction and my my English lit roots. But, but since we're talking about the Vispas being the SJWs, I stayed on that word Vispas for the longest time. What the what the heck does Vispas mean? And I said it to myself out loud over and over. And then one night, literally within the last week, just as a goof, I said it in my Bella Lugosi voice, and I said, Vispas. The Visperers are whispering. The Vispas. The Vispas that emanate from the Vispa network. And I suddenly knew what Vispas meant. So then what was Cyberfrog? I still think Cyberfrog can be one of two things. I think the, uh, the obvious um, choice is that Cyberfrog is Ethan. But I think an argument can be made that um, Cyberfrog is the spirit of comics in the 90s. Um, the spirit of fun. The spirit of escapism. I keep coming back to this idea that Heather is the Cyberfrog comic. If we assume for a second that Cyberfrog, the character, is Ethan, then I think that after his death, hibernation, and rebirth, him finding the character Heather is much like Ethan's return to the Cyberfrog comic. So there's still part of me that thinks Heather is the Cyberfrog comic itself. But Cyberfrog finds Heather. And Heather introduces him to the community of survivors. Which I took the community of survivors to be the, what they call the OGCG, the original Gangsters comic strip, the Captain Cummings and the Nurkishes. Um, but can also symbolize um, the Scott Snyders and the uh, Sean Gordon Murphys of the industry who aren't themselves SJWs but live in mortal fear all day, every day of saying the wrong thing or saying the right thing in the wrong way or in any way stepping on the toes of someone who can destroy their career in a heartbeat. So there's a little flexibility for me there on who the survivors represent, but I think an argument can be made either way. that The, 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 the gist, whether they're OGCG or whether they're current terrified male comics pros either way these are the uh, the characters who don't want to combat the SJWs they just want to huddle down and hide from them and here's Cyberfrog Ethan saying that's no way to live I, I can show you a better way these creatures can be fought. They can be resisted. And we can win. Then comes the day that Cyberfrog fights a lone Vespus. A lone Vespus. And 
I did not look, but I'll, I would be very surprised if somewhere on that lone Vispus there's not a tattoo of a semicolon. A lone Vispus, he battles and overcomes. And that battle could well have taken place on B. Clay Moore's Facebook page. And he defeats this lone Vispus, who possibly has a semicolon tattoo on his arm. And as a result, all the other Vispus, who probably didn't even know the name of that lone Vispus before, but they lionize and champion that lone Vispus as though he were the most important person in the world, and they swarm after Cyberfrog. To punish him for having taken out that lone Vispus. And th- this is the part where I think uh, it- it's-, it's public knowledge. You know, one- once we can understand what the Vispus, how they communicate, they all speak SJW fluently. I'm so sorry that happened to you be better we talk to each other so shape up we're taking names it's um I think a uh, a, a stroke of perfection that this um, the folder that's coming out redoes the infamous milkshake photo uh, with Vispus replacing that gruesome group. And that's where Wreck Planet ends with Cyberfrog feeling mortally wounded or feeling being mortally wounded. He's got that uh, that huge stinger. He's being nursed back to health by Heather, who, as I say, I, I think may be the Cyberfrog comic. I could be wrong on that. The most important thing in Cyberfrog's life at that moment is Lily. And Lily's been taken from him by the SJW Vispus. And right at the very end, in the form of hope, like the last thing to leave Pandora's box, in the form of hope, Sal shows up. So that's my take on the allegory of Cyberfrog the meta meaning of redoing Cyberfrog and the chronicle of our times that I think Cyberfrog will be the the, the times we live in now are not going to last forever the 50s didn't last forever the 60s didn't last forever The 70s and the 80s didn't last forever. The 90s didn't last forever. The era we're in is not going to last forever. And it's going to be replaced. Now hopefully it's going to be replaced by something better. Hopefully the pendulum is going to swing back. Hopefully it's not going to get worse. But when it changes into something else, in the same way that people look today at Invasion of the Body Snatchers as an allegory for the Red Scare of the 50s or The Crucible 
as an allegory for what Arthur Miller saw as McCarthyism. I think people are going to look to Cyberfrog as an allegory for what the comic book industry was like during this era, what pop culture and entertainment were like during this era, and what the mind-numbing thought police Bolshevik unforgiveness of society at large was like during this era. And in that way, Ethan Van Skyver is an inheritor of Arthur Miller, Charles Dickens, and James Joyce himself. This has been Tom Tuttle.